Um, I'm going to scoot this a little closer to you. I think somebody waved a note at me, and I think it's they want us to be louder. Is, is that right? Is that what I read? Okay. Um, I'm glad you didn't hear all that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious. People often <clears throat> refer to you or label your art pop and they call you a pop artist. And I know it's a label you don't particularly care for or like. At least that's what I've heard. And so my question for you is, why don't you care for the label? And how is your work different than a pop artist such as Warhol or Lichtenstein? Well, I did like the term pop when my son Paul used it for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's about it. Uh, several reasons, I think. I didn't go to art school, for one thing, so I'm here under Paul false pretenses. <laughs> but I had a lot of wonderful men and women who helped me and showed me how to do things. They were so generous and, uh, and also uh, idealistic about how things should be. Wonderful graphic artists of all kinds, wonderful women fashion illustrators, sign painters. These are people who are involved in the tradition of excellence. They want to do things well. And these people always, when they would talk to me about whether it was sign painting, they would criticize it directly for what that thing is, what excellence means, show you examples of people who could do it so beautifully. So I have a great love of illustrators, commercial artists, cartoonists, because they strive for excellence. That's not different to me from being a so-called fine artist. I think there's a lot of pretension about categorical definitives. He's a fine artist. He's a sign painter. He's just a cartoonist. You know. Those don't fit well with me because I admire what those people do, what they've accomplished. So pop art, when it uh, comes along for me as a a disservice to the people which those particular pop artists take on as an appropriation. It's a great philosophical possibility for people to write really quite cogently and quite with amazing kind of uh, kind of uh, ferocious dialectical investigation. So you can take something like pop art, which represents a certain condition, and then if you're philosophically inclined, or even aesthetically or art historically interested, then that movement, which whatever it is, can represent a kind of Rosetta Stone on which you can amplify and talk about at great length. But if you look at what those objects are, which is my training and what I do, I'm just an old fashioned painter, they seem to me to be very thin. A great illustrator and his skills or her skills are so evident that you don't have to make philosophical speculations or qualifications for them. And for me, I think when things are sorted out, the effect of something like pop art has to be examined and evaluated in terms of 
the whole tradition of painting like every other style. So I'm not a card-carrying pop artist. <laughs> What artist would you say has had the greatest impact on your own career? I don't think there is one. Um, there are so many. When people ask me, for instance, what is your, who's your favorite painter or that kind of question. Um, and we used to sit around when the drawing, when we were drawing together, for instance, we'd say, well, who's your, who, if you had to spend your rest of your life with one painter, who would it be? That's a terrible question. <laughs> <laughs> but we had to come up with someone, right? So I, mine was Degas. And the reason is, more intellectual, I think, than emotional, which is not a good way to think. But I'm thinking as an old teacher, I guess, where what I want around to speculate about, what to talk about, what to enjoy, and that damn day God did everything. You know? <laughs> Neoclassical beginnings, great formalist, great historical, uh, kind of awareness, very bright man, wrote sonnet, sonnets, very beautiful sonnets, incidentally, but did sculpture, all graphic medias, pastel, oils. I mean, the, the damn guy just couldn't leave anything alone, just <laughs> everything. So you have this, in a way, with Degas, an art historical textbook on one hand. So. I don't know, is that interesting at all? I don't know what that is. <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was very... <laughs> and you mentioned this kind of is a perfect lead into my next question. You also have painted still lifes and figures and landscapes. And do you have a preference of those genres? Do you have one that you love to do more than the other? No, I've just sinned in every media. <laughs> I like them all. I, uh, I suppose oil painting would be a, the most challenging, particularly if you're trying to paint the figure, which is impossible. So I suppose that as in terms of a hierarchy of a challenge and uh, intrigue, uh, hope, would probably be oil painting. And in terms of your subjects, do you rank those, still lifes, figures, landscapes? Figures the toughest. The most difficult, um, most intriguing. Uh, the thing I've done probably most badly. <laughs> but it's, uh, pro uh, I think your preferences depends on the problems you are trying to set for yourself, maybe. If, for instance, you're investigating color, trying to find out about that. Then you would go to those colorists, those great achievers who uh, would be examples for what you could take from, what you could steal from. And uh, that would be a time when you would bathe yourself and involve yourself with Bonnard and Vuillard and and Matisse, and Indian miniature painting, and Japanese prints, and painters who, because color has its own language and its own characteristics which offer for you these options, that that would be your favorite maybe for months or years, or maybe forever. Maybe, maybe one, one thing would be enough for the rest of your life. Uh, I mean, we have these extremists in painting, which is so marvelous. You say, 
And I often say to students, well, pick something that you're going to focus on and in a way give your life to, you know, to really measure yourself against that problem. Well, let's say, why don't you give me one? And I give these kind of things to my students. <laughs> students. I say, all right, you can only paint in black for 10 years. No, I'm not going to do that. Well, some nut did. He was willing to be called the black monk of painting. Who the hell was that? You know? And Reinhardt was so nutty that he closed himself off to this monkish search for teaching us to see in shadows and disappearing light ineffableness. That's a great lesson. And he made an achievement out of that limitation. And limitations are the means by which extreme accomplishments are achieved. Now you've got to, since I haven't taught for a while, I've turned into this enormous gas bag tonight. <laughs> I've got to be shorter in my answers. No, I, I'll just ask less questions. It's perfectly good. It's good either way.